Supervisor Newton would have closed the books on darn Cat Randall, informant, had it not been for Patty. Zeke had used up his last chance the night before. Patty, though, was sure that if they would only be patient, D.C. would lead them to Miss Miller. After Ingrid left for work the next morning, Patty made a call at the jewelry store of her good friend, Mr. Hofstetter. Mr. Hofstetter was a very elderly and very honorable man. When Patty outlined the plan her fertile little brain had devised, he clapped his hands over his face in despair. But eventually she won him over. She telephoned the FBI and asked for Supervisor Newton. I am Miss Daphne Hofstetter, she told him, disguising her voice. And I have some information. About two weeks ago, I sold a watch band to Miss Margaret Miller, the one who was kidnapped by the bank robbers. Patty described the expansion bracelet and the watch to an excited Mr. Newton. She added that she had been out of town and had only just heard of the kidnapping. When she hung up, the supervisor turned to Zeke. Well, there's no question about what the cat... I'm turning the page dragged in, to coin a phrase. It is Margaret Miller's watch. I think we'd better pursue the cat angle a bit further. In my 25 years with the Bureau, Newton added, this is the craziest lead I've ever heard of. As luck, or possibly feline contrariness, would have it, darn cat overslept that night. Supervisor Newton himself took charge of the surveillance, operating the main communications control in Ingrid's room. This was so that Zeke could direct the actual trailing of D.C. Mr. Newton kept looking at his watch and suggested they give the slumbering informant a tiny shove. Patty explained that this would be the worst possible psychology. When I think of that poor little helpless cat walking into that bunch of desperate criminals, she said, I can hardly stand it. That cat is about as helpless as the U.S. Marine Corps, Ingrid remarked but she was worried, too. When D.C. awoke and stretched, Supervisor Newton spoke into the communications panel. Attention all units. Informant about to leave. You will monitor Agent Kelso's movements. Take no action until you get word from me. Out. Zeke was heavily armed and carried his miniature sending and receiving set and the direction finder. He watched as D.C. sauntered across the backyard toward the alley where two agents picked him up. A half dozen agents were spotted around the neighborhood on foot, and the two bureau cars were alert and standing by. Patty nervously watched him from Ingrid's room. He's down by the trash barrel playing it cool, she told Mr. Newton. What's the matter with him, the supervisor wanted to know. Why doesn't he move? Patty shook her head. You need someone down there who understands cats, Mr. Newton, she said, especially D.C. Now, if you'd let me go along, you'll just have to leave it up to the Miss... <laughs> Excuse me. You'll just have to leave it up to the FBI, Miss Randall, he told her. We take excellent care of our men and our informants. Patty nodded. Supervisor Newton was relieved when she quietly left. Now he could give his full attention to directing their surveillance. She went through the darkened house to the kitchen, arriving just in time to see, to see Zeke head for the alley. If darn Cat had the slightest idea of the procession he was leading, he probably would have dreamed up some clever trap. But he was hungry, practically starving, in fact and he remembered where he had had some divine food, so he was not as cautious as he usually was. He didn't realize that that man was following his every movement. Neither did Zeke realize that Patty was following him, and Patty never dreamed that Canoe was following her. As it happened, Canoe had driven up just in time to see Patty shadowing a strange man across the backyard and since she had been acting a bit peculiarly lately, peculiarly, peculiarly lately, he decided to trail her. And these weren't all. 
Mr. M Mrs. McDougall's curiosity had reached the explosion stage. She had heard voices in the night and seen strange men about the Randall house. When she saw Zeke dart across the backyard, she put a scarf over her head and tiptoed to the door, hoping Mr. McDougall wouldn't notice. He did, however, and held his foot against the door. Where do you think you're going? he asked nastily. Sorry, trying to turn the page. It's very hard to hold this book. There's something fishy going on around here, she replied. And I intend to find out what it is. She pushed him aside and left. Mr. McDougall, whistling softly to himself, went to the phone and dialed a number. A moment later, he said, Police, I want to report a prowler, a man dressed like an old woman. Yes? Yes, I've seen him before. I think he may be dangerous. Then he hung up, removed his hearing aid, and went happily to bed. Mrs. McDougall, of course, got a late start, and when she reached the alley, no one was in sight. Actually, D.C. was in the next block. Zeke watched him walk along on a rather high fence, then disappear on the other side. Zeke, who had to keep in form at all times, leaped nimbly over a few moments later. Over, okay. D.C. led him a hazardous course through backyards filled with many obstacles, such as bicycles, refuse cans, flower beds, and the like. But Zeke was able to follow, aided by his direction finder and the beep-beep broadcast from the cat's collar. Patty had a much harder, harder time, but Zeke was a much larger object to trail than D.C., and she managed to keep him in sight. Canoe, on the other hand, ran into trouble. He had never been noted for caution, and he leaped over the fence without first looking on the other side. He alighted square on a trampoline. Turning the page. The top canvas was a perfect landing pad. Canoe flew through the air and landed 20 feet away in a swimming pool. While all this was going on, Mrs. McDougall was looking in vain for the action, and the police were looking for Mrs. McDougall. She went scampering down the alley, stopped to listen, peered over a fence and into a nearby lighted window. Seeing nothing, she turned suddenly to reverse her direction and ran smack into the arms of a tall policeman. A second policeman materialized, and when she saw his gun, she stifled a scream. Don't bother to put on an act, the first policeman said, pushing her away. We know who you are. Mrs. McDougall, when she had recovered from shock, was furious. The policeman with a gun tried to search her, and she slapped him soundly. How dare you, she said angrily. The officers pinned her arms down. I'm trying to turn the page. Although they met with considerable resistance. As they led her off to the police car, one of them told her, I don't want to tell you how to run your racket, Mac, but if I were you, I wouldn't wear women's clothes. With your face, you can't get by with it.